Now, in one of my last videos, I explained a variety of a mystical experience that my sister reported having. And one of the things I said that was true of almost all of these religious experiences or mystical experiences that people have is that they are ineffable. They are really, really, really hard to give voice to. It's really hard for the person to describe what happened to them. And then I said it's not that hard to account for if my sister had had these experience, similar experiences in different cultures, how she would automatically link it up with the cultural religious tradition that she had been birthed into. So if she had the experience in Tulsa, Oklahoma, she'd be like, you know, Jesus was really trying to speak to me last night. i got to get to church more often. And if she had the experience in India, she'd be like, you know, Shiva was really <laughs> whatever. You get the idea. Now, here's another interesting thing to consider. Let's just say for argument's sake that my, what my sister had was a legitimate experience of the transcendent. Now let's imagine that she is, you know, a hunter-gatherer 7,000 years B.C. or whatever, 20,000 years B.C. And there is no religious context whatsoever. She's the first person in a tribe of hunter-gatherers to have this type of experience. Now what happens? Remember, the experience is impossible to explain, impossible to give voice to. So she's had some form of experience with the transcendent reality. You say it's all happening in her mind. Doesn't, that doesn't really negate the reality. It could be a subjective internal experience and still for whatever reason that we do not fully understand, has somehow given her access into perceiving a transcendent reality. That, in fact, exists. The only thing I'm trying to point out with this, it's not hard to imagine how she would operate from there forward. Say she had no specific religious context to put that in. And let's say she was talented. She would start giving it its own context. She'd come back and tell some tribesmen, hey, look, I had this experience of peace. And they'd start calling it the great father elk. Somebody would, de somebody would define the experience for her, just like that. She tells it to the tribe. Some Weisenheimer would go, that's the great father elk. I know that experience. That's great father elk. And then he make up a story about Great Father Elk, who, who, you know, frowns on this and likes this, and does this and likes that. See, where I'm going with all of this, it's really, really, really actually not that complicated to account for all the different varieties of religious experience. It's even possible to account for them with the idea of there is perhaps a one true transcendent reality undergirding all of it. And people learn to define it in the only way that they can know to give voice to. So she's a hunter-gatherer. There's no religious tradition. There's no mythological tradition. She says, look, this just happened to me. I just had this really profound experience of peace and meaning. And so there are some people who, don't, who, who go, scoff. Oh, scoff. You didn't have that. I'm an atheist. Yeah, there's going to be one or two of them in the group. They're going to be, they're going to be there. I'm an atheist. They got evidence. All I'm trying to point out is that there are immediately going to be talented tribesmen who try to personify that experience or try to give voice to that experience or try to enact that experience in rituals, stories, mythologies. Now you understand the genesis of the whole thing. And all I'm trying to show you is that it's really easy to account for all of the varieties of different contexts that this may take form. Why? Because it's happening to different people. So, it ha so, so she has this experience in Africa. They're going to go, that's Great Father Elk. I had a similar experience. Great Father Elk was speaking to me, trying to tell me that we need, and they're going to try to personal, they're going to personalize the experience, and they're going to ritualize the experience, and they're going to start trying to use the transcendent nature of the experience to shape the behavior of the tribe in a given way. Great Father Elk was trying to tell us how to, how to improve our, you know, whatever, our hunts. We got to do X. We got to start, we got to start chasing all the elk down as a group. I don't know. They're doing something. They're, they're, I don't know what they're doing exactly. I don't know how to hunt elk. 
I don't know the best way to hunt elk. Didn't think about it before I made the video. I really don't. No idea. But I guess I don't get them all as a herd and chase them over a cliff. I think the Indians did that. Okay. So Great Father Elk is speaking that. And now let's say say identical experience happened and these are people who live on the seashore. Guess what the father's going to be? Is it going to be Great Father Elk? No, probably not. It's going to be Great Father Fish. <laughs> I swear to God, that's how it works. So Great Father Fish came out of the ocean to tell us how to catch better fish. And they're going to start enacting rituals to try to personify the experience. All I'm trying to point out is the varieties of different religious experiences are giving voice to all in some way, shape, or form or attempting to give voice to the same transcendent reality. This accounts for some of the profound similarities, similarities, I said, in different religious traditions. Did you know, for example, and you probably don't, that the Hindu concept of Brahman, the Hindu concept of Brahman, if I just read it from the book of uh, the Upanishads, you know what it would sound exactly like? The Hebrew concept of God prior to them calling it Yahweh. Transcendent reality that stands behind everything. That's unknowable. The eternal other. The ways they start describing the Brahman. The life whatever. They don't call it God. But it's a very similar idea to he who can't be named. It's not that hard to understand, or it's not that hard to imagine that what the Hebrews were doing were actually personifying something that had appeared other places and in other times to different cultures. It's not really that hard to, it's, it's, matter of fact, it's kind of exactly what's going on. So, that's all on that for now. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's all. <laughs>